Uh, Sherry. Uh, I hate that little voice that says record. Oh, Catherine on the Upper East Side, I always wave. Okay. No, I'm feeling much better. I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> no, that, yes, that would have been a lot. been sad. Yeah. I, I literally, though, I was sitting here and I was like, now what do I do? <laughs> so anyway, yes. Um, and that was a good, interesting, that was a good way to start by talking in, in a lecture about humor. With laughter. This is good. Um, okay, so we are, are we on um, Facebook? I don't think we are yet. Not yet. We'll get there. And while we're waiting. Oh, Tom has to leave in a few minutes, but just came to say. Oh, no, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. That, now, see, what a community are we that Tom came just to say hi. I, I deeply appreciate that. I'm, I'm laughing, but actually, I love our community. Um, Tom is trying to get bingo really fast. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry you have to leave early, but I appreciate that you came to say hi. Um, I, I am not seeing the Facebook button. I will find it. Um, so we may have to do it like a, we may come live on Facebook a few minutes in, but I think everyone would like to, would like okay. to hear. Perhaps we'll, we'll start and I'll continue to work on it and I'll, okay. I'll check in with Matt and see if he has grand advice for me. Okay. Okay, I will start with a slow intro and we'll we'll see what happens. That um, sounds great. But we're recording and we're here. Um, I don't know if that counts as a statement necklace, but I will say it. Okay. <laughs> it was very nice. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so um, there's Matt. There he is. Okay. I just had to say hi, everybody. I, Hello, we have Matt. a session today, but I yeah. wanted to say hi before we started, so. And, and Matt, because I am not as adept, where is the Facebook button or could you push it? Um, sure, actually, I'm not the host, so I really can't. <laughs> oh, but you could, which she could make you a host. Yeah, if you want to make me a co-host, I'll, I'll set that up for you. Can you. Carolee, what, what number is it? <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, 25, okay. <laughs> Season two, episode 25? Yep. Wow, quite amazing. We're working hard at this. I know, and you're doing this from afar. Yes, Kentucky today. Lovely Kentucky. Lovely Kentucky. Working I don't hard, to, helping teachers. I don't know how to make someone a co-host, so I can't help Grace there. Um, okay, I'm going to start doing introduction stuff. I think you. that sounds good. Well, right, I'm going to hide away, but it was nice. I just want to say hi to everybody. Thanks for coming, Matt, and saying hi. Okay, hello, everybody. To a slightly scrambled, uh, but all here in full form, uh, History Matters. Uh, and everyone, you can see, you can hear me. Is that true? I know there's no background. Just someone tell me that you can. Yes, loud and clear. Excellent. Okay, needed to know that. Okay, so um, the topic of today, you know, a lot of the um, topics that we have been discussing in many recent weeks have been a little bit dire. Um, and let me change the view here. Okay, um, have been a little bit dire. Uh, and so I thought today, what's slightly less dire? <laughs> really obvious answer to that is humor. We could talk about humor. So, um, but that is what I'm going to do today. And it's obviously a subject I love. Um, however, although I will be talking about uh, humor of particularly the founders, let me move chat out of the way there. Okay, um, there we go, of particularly the founders. Um, I'm actually, as always, going to talk about a historical topic by ultimately tying it to the present and using it to suggest to you uh, some things to think about uh, in thinking about current day politics and current day political figures. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if, um, Grace, do you want us to keep working on Facebook and I could give the rules of the game as I remember them or do you have the rules of the game? Oh, we cannot hear you. Of course you cannot. Uh, I will get the Facebook up and running. I it, it appears that John is the host since he came on before me. We will get that going in just a moment. Um, I think the folks on Facebook will be delighted whenever you come on. Um, but yes, uh, and, and Matt is still here. Um, we are very pleased that everyone is with us. Uh, please participate in the chat. We're, we're excited to see your thoughts. Uh, if you do have a question, please put it in the question and answer, and we will make sure to ask Joanne these questions at the end. Um, 
please keep this. Uh, of course, this is a family friendly show. We have people logging in from all over the world. So so keep it keep it appropriate. But we're, we're very excited to hear your opinions. Um, and if you're interested in NCHE, please, the National Council for History Education, please check us out at ncheteach.org. Um, and Joanne, we're just delighted to hear what you have to say today. Well, thank you very much. I am very happy, as always, to be here. Um, okay, so um, in my in the notes, I always I get up early. I think about the topic. I write notes, um, and in the notes in front of me, what I see on the top of the page is humor. We need some. <laughs> That's the deep thought that went into um, what I did today. Let's see if this is better. No, it's not. Okay, I'm going to go back here. Um, so I'm partly offering this as I suggested at the outset um, because we need something a little mellower, uh, and I'm hoping that we can enjoy this conversation. But also, as always, um, I do have a larger point because I do think, uh, and it's a logical thing to assume, how one uses humor or how one jokes says a lot about the person doing the joking. And particularly if they're a politician or a public figure, it says a lot about their mode of engaging with the public or their mode of conducting politics. And since I am a political historian, I'm gonna be talking about some politicians today and how they used humor. Now that makes total sense, that connection between humor and um, political method, because if you think about it, humor is when you get right down to the base of it, a way of connecting with someone or a group of people on kind of a person to person level. You're, you're getting at something that gets beneath the surface in one way or another uh, and re requires, I guess, some connection. If the person's going to understand your humor, you have to share some point of reference. Um, so it makes sense that modes of joking or, or ways of being humorous reflect modes of conducting politics. That said, it is also true that um, humor does not necessarily age well very very often it's it's of a particular time and place um i can certainly vouch for the fact and, and you will hear this today um sometimes i'm chuckling happily at you know jokes of the founders uh that no one else finds funny <laughs> i think you'll find the ones i picked at least somewhat humorous but um humor is of a particular time and place and if you don't have the language and the context and the background as with everything else in history you can't fully understand it now um i'm going to mention uh a few people here humor among a few founder folk here i'm going to end up with hamilton um because he he has a problematic sense of humor but i will start out by saying and you might already be thinking this it is very hard to imagine some founder folk even if you get to the point, as I like to do in my work, when you envision them as actual human beings who are flawed uh, and engaging in things on a moment by moment basis, even then, for example, it's a little hard to imagine George Washington yucking it up, right? George Washington telling a joke. We have that image of him, the, the jaw clenched image of him, very staid, you know, in that black suit. That's not a laughing guy. Now, there is um, someone named Paul Zoll, Z A L. Um, who wrote a series of books on basically founding folk and other such folk laughing. And there is a book he wrote called George Washington Laughing, Humorous Anecdotes by and About Our First President from Original Sources. Now, and I have to say, he also wrote about Ben Franklin and Abraham Lincoln, um, and I think even Francis Hopkinson, who should be honored to be in that company. At any rate, the Washington book is largely a collection of jokes that Washington heard. <laughs> so we get Washington sometimes laughing at other people's jokes. We don't get Washington really joking a lot in, in that particular uh, volume, which is very funny. Um, and I have a note here that uh, I haven't looked at that book. So some of this is coming from work I did um, at least a decade ago. Uh, I wrote a paper on Alexander Hamilton's sense of humor. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. But um, I have here a note to myself that says Washington seems to have enjoyed a good pratfall because he was amused and laughing when a clergyman's hat was blown into a lake. You'll get up humor on the part of George Washington. OK, so that's Washington. Um, and it kind of makes sense that as careful as he was with his image and has as much as he was trying to not connect himself and r remain kind of a neutral umpire, um he's not going to be a person who's going to venture into that territory very often and lo and behold he didn't jefferson 
had a sense of humor, not a roaring sense of humor, he did, but it's very much the structured wit of the Salonier, right? Clever, concise, um, a sort of sometimes play of words. Again, not knee slapping humor. Um, one little tiny example uh, of Jefferson's sense of humor is in a letter that he wrote in 1813 to Abigail Adams about his grandchildren. And I'm, I'm just gonna quote him. I have compared notes with Mr. Adams on the score of progeny, and I find I am ahead of him. I have 10.5 grandchildren and two and three quarters great grandchildren, and these fractions will ere become units. Ha! <laughs> that's that's humor. Like, ooh, I, I've got two almost grandchildren. So he, uh, Jefferson again, not surprisingly, as a politician, he has a very deliberately crafted public persona. Uh, and here we see him deploying a very deliberately crafted form of humor. John Adams um, probably has the best sense of humor of any of the sort of high level founding folk, um, and it, which is why it's a particular pleasure to uh, study and read his writings because he actually jokes and not only that, but he's self deprecating. He jokes about himself. That's there's that's really hard to find among the sort of self important founding folk or any other self important politician. Um, two little examples uh, which show why he's so enjoyable and and human a person to study uh, in the election of 1800 which we've talked about before a really fraught presidential election. Um, there was a rumor circulating and obviously it was a Jeffersonian Republican rumor aimed at Federalists. And it said that um, Adams as president had sent Charles C. Pinckney to England to procure, as I wrote here, four mistresses. Uh, mistresses is a nice way of saying something else, two for each man, right? Great rumor. Adams was amused and, and wrote in a letter to a friend, I do declare upon my honor, if this be true, General Pinckney has kept them all for himself and cheated me out of my two. Okay, you gotta really like, Love that guy. There's also a letter um, that he wrote to Jefferson, uh, which I saw years ago, and I can't remember the date of it for the life of me, but it's out there. Um, what in their retirement correspondence between Adams and Jefferson, uh, Adams signs a letter saying something like um, 80 years of age and too fat to last much longer. So John Adams has an actual sense of humor and is willing to be self deprecating. Um, that said, you know, one of the things that's striking about Adams is that for better and worse, he was always honest to a fault, right? He got he gets in trouble sometimes for that. He's, he puts himself right in the middle of everything he does and, and becomes vulnerable for that. There's a reason why he's a one-term president, right? He doesn't really please the, the Federalists who are his supporters. He certainly doesn't please the Republicans. He's not trying to please people He's just kind of putting himself in the middle of things. So again, the fact that he actually has a sense of humor that one can see makes sense. Okay, this brings us to Hamilton. Now, years ago, I gave a paper at Princeton on Hamilton's sense of humor. I don't remember what I was supposed to talk about. This is probably not what I was assigned to talk about, but I was intrigued with the idea that I'm exploring here. Um, and the wonderful historian Pauline Mayer um, was part of the panel at Princeton. She was the, the, the person who was going to offer commentary on the papers at the panel. And, and she and I are friends. So when she said this, it was not intended as a, as a cut in any way. She stood up and, and she said, now, Joanne, Joanne's paper reveals she has a very special relationship with Alexander Hamilton because she noted humor in places where some others might not. Um, and you'll see what I'm talking about and what she's talking about. I've always loved that. Um, the fact of the matter is, and this also, given everything that I've just said, is not surprising. Hamilton's humor is very much of a kind with the way he conducted politics. So he himself was ambitious, erratic, energetic, impulsive, sometimes really ill-judged, quick-witted, and also very quick-tempered. And his humor 
is sort of along those lines. And when you search through his writings, he's not the sort of person to muse on paper. It's not as though you can find him making all kinds of jokes, although there are one or two correspondents he engages with where you can pretty reliably think he's gonna actually usually tell an off color or inappropriate joke. Um, but generally speaking, his correspondence is kind of littered with unfortunate pronouncements and impulsive one liners. And sometimes they got him into actual political trouble. Um, in Hamilton's case, what we'll see here is he's using humor as a kind of performance, right? A kind of one-upmanship that he's trying to sort of take control of political situations by daringly throwing something out in front of people and, and sort of owning the moment. Again, very Hamiltonian way to deploy humor. Um, now, he did like practical joking. Um, he did in 1799 hold a fake seance at a party as a party trick. Uh, and it's a long story, which I can I can either tell uh, during the Q&A or um, afterwards at our after party. Um, but he did have this fake seance. And of course, word got out that Hamilton had had a seance. Uh, he was at the time he was inspector general of the United States Army. It got in the newspapers and he had to step forward, as did reporters and say, no, 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 we checked into it. And he's not he's not involved in the occult. It's actually a party trick, but that's like one example of him doing something that he thought would be great. He went through this great effort to get this person who was well known for these fake seances, didn't play well. But the one I want to talk about here uh, that really shows something about his politics as well as the moment took place in 1792. And Hamilton at the time um, was walking out of his office, he walked onto the street. Um, and he happened to bump into Maryland Representative John Francis Mercer, who was a particularly aggressive and, and somewhat by some people disliked representative in Congress. Um, Mercer immediately uh, began, actually, I don't know if he's in Congress, but he was a political opponent. I'll have to check that after. Um, Mercer immediately began to berate Hamilton for failing to reimburse him for some horses of his that had been killed in battle during the revolution and Mercer insisted it on the street you know if someone else made this claim you would have no difficulty paying it that basically you are not paying me out of sheer spite this is personal so Hamilton this becomes a big deal and what that means wonderfully for us is that there's long explanations about what people thought happened so Hamilton actually describes the moment and he says I well remember that I felt a momentary embarrassment from this address, it appeared to me to impeach the partiality of the officers of the Treasury on the ground of some personal opposition to you, Mr. Mercer, which I could not well avoid referring to myself. So Hamilton is on the street. He assumes now that he's been not only is the Treasury being insulted and its employees, but he himself has been insulted publicly. And there's a group of men that they're standing among. So this is a public insult. Um, Hamilton says that he paused for a moment, which is very un-Hamiltonian, to consider whether he should respond, quote, gravely or with pleasantry. And he decides pleasantry, right? I'm not going to be offended. I'm going to offer a joke. So first he says to Mercer, you know, you're setting a great precedent here because I lost a few horses during the war and I'd like to be compensated for them too. Yeah, that didn't fly. Um, then he says, you know, veterans can legally be compensated only for personal services that they themselves rendered to the United States. So unless you're your horse, you can't be compensated. But the horse, the horse had a lot of public service. So if you're the horse, or if you wanna get the horse compensation, we can do that. Okay, also does not play well with Mr. Mercer. So um, finally Hamilton realizing no one's laughing at anything and he kind of wants to press the point and go away. He says kind of as he's walking away, um, there's an easy way to settle this matter. And he basically says to Mr. Mercer, if you'll vote for my bill that's up in Congress the next day, so he is in Congress, um, quote, we'll make the thing very easy. We'll contrive to get your account settled. And Hamilton says, upon this, a laugh went around the person's presence and we parted in good humor. So what he says is, you know what? You want to get paid for your horse? Vote for my bill tomorrow in Congress and I'll see what I can do. So it's a bribery joke. The Secretary of the Treasury is making a bribery joke in public in front of someone who really dislikes him. Uh, so, and the reason we know this is this long explanation. And at the end, he says, but everyone laughed. 
<laughs> after that, at some point, he has to keep circling back and saying, but it was a joke. It was a joke. I wasn't really trying to bribe people. Now, Mercer, the reason why this gets out is Mercer has to run for Congress. And he decides he's going to run for Congress by opposing the corrupt, evil Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, and suggesting he himself is the only man who's well qualified to stand up to Alexander Hamilton, and that's why he deserves to take office. And he says Hamilton, in a variety of different ways, is corrupt. Hamilton demands an explanation for that, and so we're now veering into personal insult dueling territory. Mercer says, well, you're twisting the words that I said during my campaign. I didn't personally insult you. And as a matter of fact, I could twist your words in an interesting way too. I could talk about that bribery thing you said to me on the street. Okay, this then becomes even more public knowledge and it begins to circulate. Washington goes back to Virginia for some business and he's told about this. Like, have you heard? Alexander Hamilton tried to bribe a Congressman for a vote. This, this is not going well. Washington writes in a letter, this is a charge of so serious a nature that it is incumbent on Colonel Hamilton to clear it up or for the President of the United States to take notice of it. And you then get after this 10 months of controversy over Hamilton's sort of ha 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 moment as he's walking away, trying to sort of take command of the moment and, and stroll off. In the end, the two men sort of travel around the possibility of a duel. Hamilton sends a letter that would have been a formal letter uh, initiating an affair of honor. Mercer doesn't quite respond the way that one could. Hamilton doesn't quite respond. So for months, they're essentially going back and forth and saying what often happens in an affair of honor when no one really wants to fight a duel. Basically, I'm ready to fight when you are, but you're the one who insulted me. So I'm the victim. So they go back and forth writing letters to each other saying this, basically. Um, in the end, no one wants to fight, and after a lot of useless exchanging of letters, it sort of fizzles out, which is what happens in most affairs of honor. So again, if you want to understand the sorts of things, the talents, I suppose, or skills that um, enabled Hamilton to rise to power, he's aggressive, he's daring, um, he says things that you don't think people should say and says them with such a spirit. He takes ownership of them that sometimes that works really well. He's also impulsive and indiscreet and gets himself in trouble a lot. And by 1801, some of his followers literally are saying, Mr. Hamilton is too indiscreet and we cannot follow him anymore. So um, his humor is an exact replica of his political method for better and worse. Now, humor as revealing about political method um, is not just obviously a founding issue. I just happen to know those people well and knowing me uh, and my sense of humor, um, I, I remember that stuff. That stuff stays in my head. Um, but of course, there are other instances and a really obvious one that you may already be thinking about. And I've got chat down below, so I can't tell what you're talking about. But Abraham Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln, very well known for his sense of humor for jokes, for quips, for anecdotes, for, I mean, it was just, if you think of him, you either think about him looking deeply melancholy or telling some kind of folksy joke, the, the sort of image, uh, mental image we have of Abraham Lincoln. Um, at, at the time, one of his friends said, um, Lincoln's stories were, quote, done to whistle off sadness. Uh, ground down by the cares of wartime office and personal tragedy, he was basically using humor partly for himself, but uh, as tempting as it is to say he was using humor to confront the graveness of the moment, the fact of the matter is he also deployed humor as political advantage, right? And, and actually, um, the Steven Spielberg movie Lincoln shows a little bit of that, right? In which he, he tells an anecdote to sort of take the moment and make a point, but make it kind of sideways so that he's not directly confronting someone, but he offers a parable or a message in a joke that very clearly makes his point. Um, that's a really brilliant mode of conducting politics, right? Is get, doing what you want to do, doing it in a way that is not obviously aggressive, that seems to be promoting friendship, uh, communication, and yet, being pretty darn direct about what you think and what you want. And ideally, others, if there are others, will understand precisely what you're doing, and they will also understand the victim of that joke 
is indeed a, a victim. So um, Lincoln, in essence, uses weapons to win uh, weapons, uses humor as a weapon to win political advantage, which I think is fascinating. There's a book about this, which I have not read, um, but in rummaging around this morning, I found um, by Richard Carwardine, C-A-R-W-A-R-D-I-N-E, which is entirely on this idea about how Lincoln politically used humor uh, strategically, which I find fascinating. The one other person I'll mention before wrapping this up um, is Ronald Reagan, right? So um, it, it was sort of a, you know, his little quips, his sort of <laughs> quips that he made as president and, and you know, um, some of them got a chuckle from people and he did it quite a lot. Um, some people took them because of their feelings about Reagan at the time as evidence that there wasn't much there aside from the actor and the sort of silly jokes that there wasn't much of an intellect there. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the Saturday Night Live um, little skit mocking him, uh, which has him sort of joking around with kids one minute uh, and then sitting down at a desk and talking Chinese and making some international spy plan. And then he goes back into joking happy guy and then people leave the room and he goes back into serious political guy. Um, but he certainly was someone who used humor um, I guess as an actor would, to sort of paint himself in certain colors, right? That, that makes sense. Uh, and politics requires acting to a certain degree. This is not a new insight, uh, but it makes sense that he's using politics that way, partly because of his training and partly because of that. that's the way he engaged with America at the time. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up so we can open this up to questions. Um, the main point here, um, what I'm really saying, and I've said it already many times, is humor can be a weapon, it can be a tool, it can be camouflage if you want it to be. But you need to think about jokes sometimes before you understand their, the cause or the motive uh, or the impact, right? It's easy, kind of in the past I've talked about um, propaganda uh, and people who say things that are, rile you up immediately. And I've said, before you get all upset, stop and think if that's the point of this person <laughs> saying this, right? Is this, is this entirely being pronounced to get you riled up? And if that's the case, think about the goal of that comment. Don't just get swept up into it. And humor, in a sense, there's a, a similar dynamic to it that, you know, it can be used in a variety of ways that can mask what's really going on. And what, what struck me, and I, I'm not normally, you know, a uh, Donald Trump swatter, um, but this, this is just very typical of the man. Um, and we can all remember moments when he did this. He would say something insulting or um, outrageous or dangerous and then say it was just a joke, right? It was just a joke. You guys don't have a sense of humor. It was just a joke. Um, I, I have to say, um, I call that abuser humor because that's what abusers do to their victims, right? They insult them to make them feel miserable. And then when the person feels wounded, they say double whammy insult. You have no sense of humor. You have absolutely no sense of humor. What's wrong with you? It's a really ingenious, nasty way of smacking at people uh, and kind of, in some cases, really getting away with it. Um, the takeaway here, and, and that's a great example of it, it's easy to just see that and say, oh, you know, he made a nasty joke and then he didn't want to make the nasty joke. Yeah, but in making the nasty joke, he made his point and then made the person look the way he wanted that person to look in responding to it. So it, he is using humor, humor um, as a weapon as well to enable him to conduct politics in the way that he wanted to conduct politics. The takeaway here, as always, think about the purpose, the motive, the impact of public jokes that appear to have been said for effect. Now, private jokes sometimes are revealing, right? As a historian, I love to find private jokes or anecdotes that weren't intended to be public. Sometimes those are the most revealing at all. But public pronouncements, those are signs of method and message in addition to being a sign of a sense of humor. So um, those are my, my words of wisdom uh, and a little bit of humor uh, for this morning. But now I will the mug. Uh, I was going to say now applause and open it up for questions and I will move chat because uh, I didn't even see Kara Lee saying yes gaslighting is precisely the word. Um, okay, so, and I will say I'm still using the wonderful mug uh, hiding device, which I love. Um, 
So I, I really, someone said yesterday on Twitter, I'm just rubbing my lipstick off here. Wonder what the heck mug she's going to find for this. <laughs> I woke up this morning thinking the same thing. I, what mug am I going to find? And then I realized I do indeed have a mug that is about political humor. It's the Bernie Mittens mug. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, come on. I'm impressed with myself. I, 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 I didn't think I was going to pull it out, but um, yeah, this, this, I, I bought this just because it was going to remind me of the moment when this became like a thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my example of something that he didn't even necessarily mean to be funny, but it got deployed in all kinds of interesting ways afterwards. So um, that's right. Francesca says, I have a second New York City apartment filled with mugs. No, I, I really am just creative in using and reusing them. It's not as, as impressive as you think, but I love the fact that it seems like I have like vast seas of mugs. Let me climb into the basement and crawl through my mug collection to find another one. Okay, I will now stop because Grace has a background. Oh, just, I just got an old theatrical poster and stuck it behind myself. Um, you know, I, I like I like the Library of Congress, so I just oh, I yes. looked at their old theatrical poster collection to find something. Oh, but I, I do love Bernie, and I do love those mittens. I, that, that was a great, I guess, meme, whatever. But um, I love the fact that comedy is happening behind you, but it's a bargain, too. <laughs> oh, OK. Keep Very comedy. Cool. <laughs> That's exactly. not what you want. That's not what you want. Ways, probably in many ways. Well, we do have we do have questions coming in and everybody again I, I know you have questions about humor i'm seeing some wonderful things in the chat so do please put things in the q a um and and i don't know if you can hear that newbie is is keep he, chuckling he is very happy with this so I, <laughs> he's in. uh okay all right, so we do have Dale uh, with a Hamilton question, always popular. Was it Hamilton who goaded G. Morris, uh, Governor Morris, into slapping Washington on the back in the Philly Tavern, and what were the repercussions of the bet? Okay, so that's probably apocryphal, uh, that anecdote, but it's a wonderful anecdote, and I like to believe that it happened because it's entirely possible that it did. And the anecdote is, uh, and, and I will say, what makes it believable, I think I mentioned during my comments today that there were a couple correspondents that Hamilton engaged with and they always somehow got him to say off color or dangerous or bad jokes. Governor Morris was one of those guys. They just like brought it out in each other. Like Hamilton made some joke about church on a Sunday to Governor Morris. So somehow the two of them, that's, that's how they play. So if this was gonna ha ever happen, it would have to be Governor Morris. So the story goes that um, they were at some kind of reception, Washington was there, um, Governor Morris uh, and Hamilton were playing. Hamilton said something like, I dare you, I challenge you to go up to Washington and pat him on the back and say you're glad to see him. And of course, he's playing off the you know amazing gravitas and presence of Washington. No one, no one pats him on the back, says, glad to see you. And he says to Morris, I'll bet you a dinner. A dinner for you and F however many of your friends, I dare you. So of course, Morris does it because this is what these two guys do together. Um, but again, I don't know if this really happened, but supposedly he goes over, pats him on the back, you know, says, we're so glad to see you. And according to the anecdote, Washington gives him such a look that Morris goes back to Hamilton and says something along the lines of, I did it, damn it, but I, totally not worth the dinner <laughs> like <laughs> bad bet <laughs> i don't know if it happened there's no evidence that it happened the, but the fact that it's governor morris is like a little bit of of truth to it um they bet like beaver hats to each other during the war they were corresponding during the war and one of them would say bet you a beaver hat that you can't do this so that was their sense of humor i offer that for whatever evidence it is but but so but that's a that is a, a really persistent anecdote the other anecdote um there are two that that continue about hamilton no evidence he said them have to do with the constitutional convention and supposedly um when someone uh suggested bringing in a clergyman uh at the beginning of their um daily sessions hamilton supposedly joked and said we don't need any foreign aid <laughs> um, I don't know if he actually did that, but it, it, it travels along as an anecdote. The other joke uh, has to do with someone asking him why God isn't discussed in the Constitution. And according to this anecdote, Hamilton supposedly said, 
we forgot. Wow. <laughs> I don't I don't think any of those things happened. Um, but it's interesting that they stick to Hamilton, right? Those they they pop up again and again and again. That's well, and there's some things in history. I think it's very important as history educators and historians that that we that we challenge things that are just myth and make sure that we ground things in fact. But sometimes I also think there's some things we can just leave alone because it's fun. <laughs> I, I and as anyone and many of you by this point have a sense of me and who I am know that I could not resist telling those stories in just the way I told them right probably not true but I'm going to tell you anyway because because <laughs> it's fun it's wonderful um I, I will respond just to um a comment that Emily made about Gouverneur Morris had a wooden leg just because I um I had a wooden leg moment a Gouverneur Morris wooden leg moment so his leg is at the New York Historical Society a thing wow. I discovered uh, there was a exhibit going on at New York Historical, and um, someone told me, whatever you do, go through the exhibit, but make sure you go into the last room. Which, and I didn't know why. And I'm like walking through, and I, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I, I was told to go into the last room. I will, and I walk in. And among other things, Gouverneur Morris's wooden leg is there, right? And it, it, I always say to people, as much as I love writing about these people, I don't need to see or touch parts of them, you know? <laughs> Right, so Grace's face is the <laughs> right face. I was just like, "Oh, that really surprised me." You know, I probably made a a little noise or something. Um, anyway, uh, for a while, his leg was on display in the lobby. Um, I even have I'll, I'll tweet it later. I have somewhere a photo of his leg. It was like there there was like a New York City early America New York City exhibit in the lobby, uh, and Morris's leg was like <laughs> in a case under a bunch of other stuff. It was like, you could walk by and not see it. It's just like, there's a random wooden leg. <laughs> I don't know what the thought was. But anyway, um, more questions. Somehow I'm, I'm picturing, I feel like all of us have maybe had these starter jobs at the front desk where you have to deal with, and like, I'm just imagining like the, the person on duty at the Historical Society when his family member or employee walked in and was like, we're donating this. And just like, you have to keep your face normal. Like, oh, thanks. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just seems know, like an awkward exchange. Well, and the whole hair thing, right? The whole locks of hair of famous people. I've seen more hair of famous people than any human being should ever see. And it it grosses me out every time. It's like, I don't need to touch a piece. And yet you sort of feel like you need to because, oh, this is a piece of name the founder, um, the guy at the center of my last book, Benjamin Brown French. I found his hair, a lock of his hair in a folder. So I've touched my, nice. my hair and it's it's like, you know, I discovered that and Benjamin Brown French is not a famous person at all. So, you know, I thought, you know, this is not like George Washington's hair. It's like, yeah, but I've spent like 17 or at least 15 years with Benjamin Brown French. Uh, like, <laughs> to touch it. It was a little, it was a little, yeah. Okay. Better you, better you than me. Good job. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm going to open back up to questions. I'm sorry. I'm like wandering off because we're talking about humor. It's, it's exciting. It's, it's ridiculous stuff, frankly. Uh, we have Dave A uh, says self deprecating humor seems to be less risky than bribery humor. Um, Ford was self deprecating about his golf game and failing. Are there others in history who are famously self deprecating? I missed the first part. Self deprecating humor seems to be linked with. It's less risky than bribery humor. Oh, Most yeah. things are less risky than bribery humor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But are are there other examples of famously, humorously self-deprecating um, political actors, I suppose? That's a good question. I'm sure there are. Uh, Adams is the one I always cite because he's so consistently, um, sometimes deliberately and sometimes not, um, self-deprecating. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think if I can think of someone. Right now, I'm not thinking of someone, but that doesn't mean there isn't someone. Um, I want to say that Aaron Burr probably did a little bit of that, um, but never like to really self-deprecating, like a little bit of like um, he said. It, it, like I'm thinking of a, a sort of joke he makes after he <laughs> after he kills Hamilton, um, and he's in Europe, and he says to someone, he writes to someone. Um, I'm not in a good situation here. And let me just give you a piece of advice. Do not have an affair and kill a political opponent at the same time. <laughs> it was like, it's a little self-deprecating. It's also creepy. 
but it's a little self-deprecating but i'm sure there are more and they're just not popping into my brain at this moment and if i think of them i will tweet about them yes and and, and we'll crowdsource it if, if you have a favorite self-deprecating yeah. historical actor do put that in the chat we're always excited to hear about historical humorists um anissa says does the office affect how the person uses humor interesting um in other words does a representative have an easier time attempting humor than a senator a senator than a cabinet member a cabinet member than a president interesting well i certainly think um simply because of the visibility and symbolism of the office that if you're a president making jokes those are the highest risk highest impact jokes um, because you might make a joke in Congress and it comes from you, but you're part of a body and you might be like quirky part of body and it, you don't matter so much, but the mm -hmm. president, people are going to try and, and read things into it. Um, what's interesting, um, I just totally forgot where I was going to go with this. Uh, oh, I, now I know where I was going to go with this. So in, in the book I just wrote, uh, Field of Blood, one of the interesting things is um, many members of Congress feel personally responsible, like they themselves represent the reputation of everything that they represent, right? Their constituents, their area, they're part of the country. So um, if they make a joke, an unfortunate joke, or if they're insulted personally, that reflects on yeah. their, their everything yep. about them. So sometimes what that means is you make a really good joke and then you're seen as like this witty man about town, but that's a risk because you might fail and be a secretary of the treasury making a bribery joke, you, you might say something that you shouldn't say. But I, I think this falls into that category for members of Congress is that there would be weird repercussions to what you say, because you are certainly in that time period, you are seen as a personal representative for these people. And they say all the time, like if they're dishonored or insulted on the floor of Congress, these people, these members of Congress will stand up and say, you can't treat Ohio that way. So that's kind of the logic, I think. That, sure. that would be that would be high risk. Fascinating. When I started to read this question, too, I was thinking about how does, how does the office affect how the person uses humor? And for a second, I was thinking, like, what is humor different in the executive branch and the legislative branch? I don't know. It's, it's, there, you know, there anyway, are, it's very interesting. It is. There are there are. So um, when I was working on violence, I definitely wanted to look at humor because um, obviously they're related. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There is a book about congressional humor that I cannot remember the name of. Some of that congressional humor does not stand the test of time. Um, I'm sure there's a book about presidential humor. I don't know. Congressional humor actually tends to be often self-deprecating, and it's more about the body than uh, of, of Congress than anything else, um, about the fact that it can't do anything or does everything really slowly or whatever, that there's some people in Congress that really shouldn't be in Congress. So. Um, but you can do that because it's a huge body with hundreds of people. And so that's actually, in a way, kind of low risk. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, Dale wants to know, are there any famous jokes told by historians to make a point? Ooh. I wow. think we're both going to sit here on camera and think I for know. a second. <laughs> um, I, I, okay, so there's one I can't tell. Um, Good answer. Uh, yeah, they're, uh, literally. They're, <laughs> they're, they're, there's one I can't tell. Um, let's see if I can think of another one. Um, no, <laughs> I can't think of another one. Uh, and this one was by a, a a senior historian who I think was trying to show a lot of younger historians that he or she was like with it and with them, uh, and it worked. Um, but right now I can't. Uh, so yeah, the the answer is going to be there have to be. I'm just not thinking of them right now. I mean it. it there are some historians that are definitely not self-deprecating in any way, <laughs> I will attest. Um, and and it can be hard to joke if you're not willing to, in some way, laugh at yourself. Um, but yeah, I, I think the answer to that is yes, um, but I can only think of one. And um, if I tell you, I will have to kill you. So I can, I will laugh at that. Again, that's always an appropriate answer. Um, let's see. All right, Kathleen, this is a very important point and I'm going to circle back to it as I think about it. Um, okay, ah, interesting. So let's go with, does gender have a role in whether humor works in politics? Mm, yes, indeed. Um, as with everything, 
uh, if a woman tries to do something that a man does, uh, it's going to be judged differently, more harshly. She's not going to get either credit for it or she's going to be blamed too much for it. And I think that's the case with humor, too. Um, you know, I think um, things won't be seen as funny if people don't see you as a precise equal. And in a sense, when you're joking, that is kind of an assertion of presence and power, right? You are sort of saying, I'm in with you guys. Let me tell you a joke. So it is, it is kind of aggressive, um, and it, and a kind of way of putting yourself on an equal par with people. And I think there are probably, um, some, particularly in um, status conscious professions like academics and like uh, the political world, uh, where a woman cannot use humor in the same way. Um, you know, I, in the course of my career, um, I, I've gotten um, I want to say attacked. People have said all kinds of outrageous things that um, just of a sort that no would never be said about a man. So, for example, um, my voice is too shrill. Okay, that that's a man who doesn't like a woman's voice. <laughs> you know, it was at a history conference, and someone was like, "Your voice is very shrill." I was like, no, it really isn't. But I now know that really you're not very excited about hearing a female voice. Um, so there are any number of things that. Um, that a woman can't do and uh, and she'll get blamed for that said sometimes that's precisely the reason to do them hmm. is because when you get that kind of response you can kind of point it out and say well that's really interesting that you don't like me doing that when you did that two weeks ago so why is it bad when i do it um so actually that's a great example of humor as weapon right uh, i do think there's a huge gender difference as with everything else right uh, there's no neutral clothing for a, a public woman right in politics and academe if you wear pants, you're sending a message. If you wear a skirt, you're sending a message. If you wear heels, you're sending a message. If you're wearing flat shoes, you're sending a message. There's no, you know, men can put on um, chino pants and a, a, you know, a dress like a normal shirt, maybe a tie, maybe not. That's maybe that's maybe as much as you're going to say, like, ooh, he's got a tie on, he's being formal. But that's kind of neutral. There's no equivalent for women, and I just think that's true in so many ways. And I think that will become less true the more accustomed we are to having women in positions of power that right now we're still in the um wow it's the first woman who ever did blah zone as long as we're saying that the person who is in that first ever is going to be looked at not just because they're not white men but also because the people who have had power are probably not that thrilled about these people <laughs> having some power so yeah gender and race i think um really complicate humor um and you know the other thing is women can joke with each other mm -hmm. you know, people of a race can joke with other people of their race um you know like jews can joke with jews about jews in a way that probably others can't i i will say as someone who's jewish um women can make jokes with other women that they might not so i i do think it's again it's really interesting because humor is so much about the connections between people and actually i didn't talk about this although i hinted at it with hamilton about relative status right that that it if you're talking about politics it, it can tell you a lot uh, kind of like dueling right i got interested in dueling because um you only duel with your equal uh, and people use it as a political tool so i thought well it's easy you know interesting right if if someone won't duel someone else why is it because they think they're beneath them in status like that's an interesting kind of measurement stick. Uh, and I think humor can do some of the same kinds of things. Thank you. That's very interesting. And just on, on gender and humor, I've done a lot of work in women's history and I, it, it is always enjoyable for me to just, you know, you've got this crumbling letter in your hands and it looks old and stodgy and you find that I just enjoy reading women's humor throughout history because yeah. they are all using it and it is there and sometimes they're jokes that i feel like i get as a woman and that makes me chuckle even though it's like a distance of hundreds of years so that's anyway. so true and it's funny very enjoyable it's funnier because you don't expect to see it because women would not be as readily eager to put that kind of thing in writing and so when they do it's such a it's such a pleasure it's sort of like you know they're talking this way you know this is happening it's just nice to see it in, in on paper yeah. Um, we have a discussion here about the Correspondence Dinner, uh, President Obama and the Correspondence Dinner. Uh, these dinners are an intentional public display with an expectation of humor. Do they in any way echo the tools and methods of other political figures past? 
in, so this intentional public display of humor it's interesting well, that's the thing is um it it's intentional and I, you know i haven't it's not something i've thought about and i'm sure there are people who've done some brilliant um analytical work on this my uh off the top of my head thought would be that what that's about is actually um highlighting and exposing um the partly hostile partly friendly relationship between people in power and the correspondents who cover them um, and so the jokes kind of have an edge and the president's a little self deprecating and you know it's it it's an edgy kind of a humor that's deliberately supposed to show both sides of that but but it, it still is humor and I think it's still grounded on the idea that there is some common ground that they're part of the same club. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're going to that dinner, you are, you are part of the same club. You're going to engage in that humor. The humor that's being sent out there by whoever's speaking is it's assumed that everyone in that room will understand it. If you're at that dinner and um, are unable <laughs> to laugh at a joke that involves you, you are not putting yourself into that club. Right. You are you are kind of asserting that you're not part of that club, whether that's because you want to assert that or because you feel that. So, again, I think um you could you could probably do a really interesting study of how um politicians presidents have responded over the years to those kinds of dinners like with, that have a semi-roasty kind of aspect to them and that required self-deprecating humor um that sometimes can go really wrong right bush joking about no weapons of mass destruction here right that some humor like is just like open mouth humor but it would be really interesting uh to use that as a kind of cultural form of evidence to talk about the government or political office holders at any particular time. That would be really interesting. Yes. Um, Charles is curious about your own relationship with humor and, and has two questions here um, that I feel like go together. So I'm just going to open this up generally okay. about where you get your own sense of humor, which you clearly have. Um, and what is your view of humor in teaching? OK. Um, yeah, well, I. Um, so I just see everything with a sense of humor. I do. Um, I, I will. Um, I will say something personal here, um, which I thought about when I was writing about abuser humor. Um, and that is, uh, at some point in my life, there was someone in my life who would say nasty things about me. And then when I looked sad, um, would say it was a joke. And then that person would say, I have no sense of humor. Uh, and when I went to college freshman year, I remember talking to people at a burger place and I remember saying, yeah, I don't really have a sense of humor, which think about that. <laughs> I mean, and I remember the friends there were like, what? And it, and it was sort of like, I realized for the first time that I had just totally internalized that. And I really believed I didn't have a sense of humor. Um, then I was allowed to have a sense of humor. I I think um, I think humor can be a way of dealing with discomfort. Humor can be a way of um, getting people to personally engage with something if they're intellectually intimidated by it. So I use humor a lot in teaching, partly because it makes me human, and partly because if my students can grasp and own the humanity, the humanness of history, they're going to understand it in a better way than if it's a series of events and dates and major things that they have to memorize. If they understand um, history as people either making choices or not being able to make choices, but in one way or another, real people uh, in situations and sometimes behaving like idiots, right? Or sometimes doing silly things or sometimes telling jokes, um, that just turns the past into something that isn't on a pedestal. So um, I think in a whole bunch of ways, um humor is a great teaching tool that said um even if it weren't i would have a very hard time not using <laughs> it. um i will say um and i hadn't thought about this until um years later but um the wonderful pauline mayer those of you who um, have ever seen her give lectures and she did a lot of documentaries pauline mayer was um not only a great historian but she was a, a woman who was one of the top historians of, of a, a top historian of early America and then just generally. She was, was renowned. And she always let herself be present in what she said. Um, 
And so once at Yale, she gave a lecture and, and in the course of it, she talked about being the first person to use the documentary edition of the ratification uh, papers. And, and she talked about um, how moved she was by that. She talked about you know, how particular items in that collection brought her to tears. Pauline kind of gave me permission to joke and laugh about what I was doing in public, on TV, in front of people. I don't know if I wouldn't have done it otherwise, but she made me feel like it was a good thing to do and that I was allowed to do it. It was so present in everything she did. So she was kind of an important model for me that way. So the, the short answer to that is, I think humor is crucially important. I don't think that means everyone has to be like, yuck, 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 let me tell you a joke. But um, I think it can serve an important purpose when it's sincere uh, and, when, and has a point. That said, I will also say that as a woman, um, I, I'm sure that sometimes my sense of humor means people can just dismiss me and not take me seriously um, because I'm not imposing my presence in gravitas um, and not choosing to behave that way. Um, I realize that's a choice. And I do think sometimes that offers people an opportunity to dismiss me, which is a mistake. Um, but I do think sometimes people do that. I think, well, I, I hope not, but um, I think we talk at NCHE, we talk a lot about making history accessible. And I think that's um, that's one thing you do and and that great, good educators do with you is it, it's a way of making history accessible to people, which and is it, a wonderful thing. It, you get to show your passion for what you're talking about, right? What better teacher is there than a teacher that shows their students they care about what they're talking about? You make the students care about it too. And humor is part of that too. So. Yes, and we do. Um, sorry, lots of interesting things in the chat, and we are we are almost finished. Yeah. I do want to um, acknowledge Kathleen's question. Um, this isn't a last two minutes of the show question, and so Kathleen, just to let you know, we will continue to be talking about this as NCHE as other history groups around the country. Um, she says this is not a funny thing, and I and she's as she asks specifically about Florida, but she's just generally asking. Uh, we we're hearing a lot about divisive concepts legislation. It's kind of the general topic we're giving it, and just um, is there to a historian is there historical precedent? Um, and this for um, so this, these are the laws that are limiting um, teachers' access to particular resources or um, use of particular ideologies. Again. Not funny, not the really the end of a no, show, no, but, except um, that I want to acknowledge that Kathleen's feeling yeah. it. And, and I think that we can say that there is historical precedent for legislatures being involved in in what educators can and use with their students. I will say there's legislative um, precedents, I'm sure, but even without a law, there's certainly massive precedents for people being made clear to people that they are not allowed to engage in a certain kind of speech or not allowed to discuss certain things, even without a law. And yeah. I will now segue and use this question to loop back around and tie it all together. Great, good job. The reason that that is the case, the reason why those laws get passed, the reason why people try to clamp down on teaching is because words matter. They matter profoundly. They matter if they're spoken in humor, they matter if they're spoken while teaching, they matter. And they matter so much that people try to silence you rather than hear you say them. So that's always something to think about, right? Just like your vote matters so much, people want you to have less of it, to have a harder time getting to it. That means it's so important. So if someone's trying to silence your words, your words are really important and you should keep speaking them. That was an amazing way to wrap that up and tie that <laughs> together. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Words matter. Educators matter. Thank you all for the work you do. Um, again, we've been delighted to have Joanne with us here at History Matters and so does Coffee. Um, we will be transitioning to an after party where we will we will stop recording. We will, we will uh -oh. not be on Facebook's, uh, whether or not they relate to humor. Um, but I uh, but say, again, um, yes, me, please. Uh, just I, I, you froze for a second, so I don't know if you said it, but for those that are on Facebook, and want to join the after party, you need to leave Facebook, you need to go to the NCHE website and join us there at ncheteach.org slash conversations. And the after party, Excellent. not recorded, less formal, you can talk about whatever you want to talk about, really fun, 
come to the after party. Come hang out. Use humor. Yes. All right. Um, Joanne, thank you so much. And again, for other resources and to learn more about NCHE, go to nche.teach.org. And thank you all so much. We're, I'll now, I'll now end the recording. Thank you so much, guys, for coming. As always, this kind of discourse is so important and, and you are making it possible. So thank you.